Warning! Tube amplifiers have lethal voltages inside them. Please do not attempt to build, test, or repair these without understanding and following all safety protocols. Hey y'all! Well, we're back to putting this chassis together. And like I said, I'm going to go ahead and do some of this stuff off camera and not duplicate what I've done in my other build videos. But I'll show you some of the few things I have done. I went ahead and drilled three millimeter holes in these locations here for these little plastic feet that this chassis came with and screw them down and then here are the two button head bolts that are the ground points and you can see on the inside got a ground point here ground point here here's where the little feet bolts come through here are the holes we drilled for bolting down the transformer and I'm gonna get a close-up here of how I did this one of these ground lugs and what I did is I drilled the hole, scraped all the anodizing off, put a K-nut, and tightened it down real tight up against the chassis. Then I put the solder lug on it, and then I put another one of these K-nuts that has the star washer built on it on top of that to sandwich it down. So that's pretty much it for the chassis prep. The way this came came with this big hole already drilled and had the RCA holes already drilled and to start with I'm probably just going to do an in and out and plug off these two holes and um, do the low pass filter later and once I get I got to order a few parts for that part of the build so this is going to bolt like this and I bent that down at 90 degrees to get it out of the way of the transformer and then this is going to sit like this and then the ground wire is just going to go from this terminal here over here to this ground log. And that's the only thing that's going to be on this ground over here. And on this ground log, we're going to... And again, the transformer is on these little rubber stands for vibration control. And so when this is bolted down, I've got a... A ground lug right here it's gonna go over to this one and then I got a um, an email into the person I got this transformer from but I'm pretty sure this yellow and green wire it's labeled as in and it's not connected electrically to any of these other wires and I'm pretty sure this is like an internal shield wire that I'm going to run underneath here and bring it over here to this ground point as well. And you can see I've started twisting up my leads already. I noticed in the commercial one, they didn't twist these leads. And I can guarantee you that's going to make some hum in the unit. Even though people aren't reporting a lot, I bet there is some. It's almost impossible to not pick up hum when you don't do the lead dress correctly. So then, let's look at the board here. The underside, I've got the output shielded cables that are going to go to the RCA jacks on the back, soldered in at the bottom, and a little contact cement to do some strain relief to attach them to the bottom of the board. And then up here, let me go ahead and zoom in on the, both of these two. And you can see I put this resistor, this capacitor, and this coupling cap all on the underside. And then I put a little bit of uh, contact cement on this capacitor to the board to make sure that it doesn't you know come loose or it's not just dangling under there and then on this side we put all four of these resistors and this coupling cap and this capacitor and again little contact cement holding it to the board 
your setup may be different. You may have to end up mounting more stuff on the top, more stuff on the bottom. It just depends on, you know, what kind of chassis you're going to have. And we did go with these Mundorf MKPs. I normally like their aluminum oil caps, but they are really too big. I mean, they're 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 not real long, but they're real big diameter, especially when you get into these larger values. And so, we're gonna see what these MKPs sound like. I've tried them before, and they sound really nice. I mean, I don't think they're quite as good as the aluminum oil caps, but they're real close. And hey, you, you got to go with what's going to fit in the space you have. That's kind of one of the limitations of doing things on a circuit board versus doing point to point is sometimes you, the components that you can use is limited by the size that you have on the board. I am going to be putting, I've got a bomb up on the website, but when I get totally done, I'll, you know, say, hey, yes, this is the, the total correct one. But so far, I think that we're, you know, really good. One of the things, too, that I found out, and I'm not really used to working with solid-state components, but I've learned that these MOSFETs, seems like every couple of weeks they discontinue one and come out with another one. And trying to search for them by part numbers a lot of times is really difficult. And, you know, you either have to try to find a good substitute by looking at the you know, the amps that it needs to have and the voltages and that sort of thing. Or you end up either spending a fortune buying some new old stock part number or you buy some China clone semiconductor that who knows whether it's decent quality or not. And so in my bomb is the MOSFET that I substituted for this. Let me see if I can see this number. Yeah, it called for a K2700, and they haven't made those in years. And the same thing with this LM7806 regulator. I had to find one that's it's exactly the same thing. It's just a modern re replacement for it. And the same thing with the Zener diodes. The part number that they have on here isn't made anymore, but obviously they still make Zener diodes. So just found one with it's actually a little higher rated one than what the board called for and the same thing on these big capacitors it called for 100 uf and the closest one that i could find that was readily available that was the right you know diameter with the right spacing was the snap in 120 uf and it's not gonna hurt anything to go up a little bit the size of that and these bridge rectifiers i went with three amp ones because they're the same size package and they were only like 50 cents more than the two amp ones and it never hurts to have a little oversize in that department. The other thing that I wanted to show you is these heat sinks, the little pegs that they that come out of the bottom of it, they go through the board. They're solderable to the board that helps make them a lot more stable. And my normal soldering iron really wasn't designed for soldering something this heavy duty and so i had this old you know monster weller that got super hot and it, it did short work of soldering those little pegs to the circuit board so you're probably going to need a little heavy duty or soldering iron to solder those um heat sink little tabs to the board and you could might be able to do it with an electronics soldering iron but it, I tried it and it just really didn't seem to work very well. And the last thing that I'm doing is, and I'm going to experiment with this, this terminal right here connects to the, it's the ground for the, one of the, fil the big filtering cap that also connects to this yellow ground plane that surrounds all this power supply stuff and normally that is where I would pick up the you know what I would call the star ground point on a point-to-point -point wired system 
and I want to experiment with, I don't like the idea of the ground for this board just floating. Just, that doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't feel safe, and just, it doesn't make sense. And, but the board doesn't show any, like, ground point on it. So, I picked up this ground plane, and I got this wire coming off that, you know, tentatively I'm going to connect it to this ground wire and not, and, you know, see if it, if it does pick up any hum by having it connected. Hopefully it won't, and then... I'll feel better about having the board itself hooked to the chassis ground. But that's something that I have to experiment with. And I know there's ways of lifting the ground using, you know, I've seen the techniques of using a bridge rectifier, or using a, a 10 ohm resistor and a cap. So those are some things we may play with too. But again, I really don't like the idea of the ground floating because if some of these components went bad and shorted the ground and there was no board ground to the chassis ground to the safety ground, some stuff may get hot that, like the RCA jacks might be able to get hot or something, you know, the grounds for the RCA jacks could end up with 200 volts on them or something if we had a component failure. And it wouldn't blow the fuse. And that's far from ideal from a safety standpoint. So that's something we're going to be experimenting with. And so I think I'm ready to, now that i got these uh, signal wires soldered into the bottom and got the tube sockets all soldered in, I'm ready to bolt the board down for the final time, bolt down this transformer, hook up our safety ground, and start wiring up the switching on the front and then running the input signal wires to the board to the volume control and to the RCA jacks on the back and I think we'll be just about done this has been a pretty quick build so hope you're enjoying this and I think I can get more into this one video so I'll come back after I get this put back together and kind of show you what that looks like Okay, so let's go over what I've done since the last video. Wired up the RCA jacks and ran these wires across here over to the Alps volume pot. Then ran some more shielded cable down here to the input jacks on the board. And one of the things I did is I wanted to keep this input signal from the power supply down here so I've got some these are just honestly these are just popsicle sticks that I cut off painted black and then use some uh, plyo bond contact cement to glue them to the case and then glue these wires to them to keep them fr away from the power supply noise and then when the case sits on top it's going to be like up in the upper corner. And as you can see, I did the same kind of thing over here that this, this is the 120 volt power that comes up here to the switch. And I used some twisted 18 gauge solid core wire that runs up here to the power switch and then back to power up the transformer. We've got so we got the wires back here to the IEC connector. This power switch came with this little circuit board. And let me zoom in here and show you what this looks like. So it came with this little circuit board. And these are the two 120 volts. But here's a thing to hold an LED with the dropping resistor. And then these two wires go down to the six volt heaters on this too. And then I experimented with the value of this resistor till I got this at the brightness that I wanted. 2K came out to a nice level. As you can see, this power transformer has these two 220 volt twisted wires that go up to the board. These are the seven volts that go up to the heater circuit that go to these voltage regulators, which then drop the voltage down for the circuit. 
The other thing that I did is I pulled out, let me zoom in here too and show you this. The other thing I did is I pulled out this ground wire that goes to this ground plane that's on this end of the board. And I didn't connect it to the chassis ground yet because I want to wait till I have it plugged into a system and then ground it and unground it and see if I can hear any change in the hum. And if I don't, then I'm just going to ground it straight to the chassis. If I do hear some hum, we'll probably ground it through a bridge rectifier or maybe just a 10 ohm resistor with a cap across it. But hopefully there won't be any problem with that and I can just ground it straight to the chassis. These jacks are going to be for future use for possibly a sub out or what I may end up doing is use like this, these jacks and this jack for separate inputs I, or rewire this whole thing. I don't know. You know, in the future, we'll figure out what we're going to do with these. Got my Mundorf MKP caps and really this thing's ready to power up and see what it looks like. So let's jump back and wrap up this video. Here we go. Here's what the finished preamp looks like. I think it turned out awesome. This is the front. Got a volume knob, got a power switch. These little chrome tube rings look awesome with the chrome tube tops, all matches. Got our functional vent here on the top to help keep the electronics cool. It all turned out awesome. The only thing that I'm not crazy about, and obviously you wouldn't see this just um, with it on the rack and connected, but I used these brass RCA jacks and just to make everything match, I ordered some, I think they called rhodium colored. Basically they're chrome looking. I think they'll look a lot nicer and it's not that hard to resolder those and put some new ones in. So everything all matches. So the next step is it's time for the shootout. We need to power this guy up, do some basic voltage checks, but it should be ready to go. There wasn't a whole lot of, this isn't like a point to point wired thing where you're wondering if you might have a wire out of place. It's a circuit board. It, as long as you got the voltage in and the RCA jacks connected in the right place, everything should work. And so we've got this guy right here, which is uses two 6S and 7s with a, a tube rectified power supply. We've got this guy over here that's supposed to be a Marant 7 clone. I haven't really gone into this one yet. It just came the other day. It's got a couple little tube rectifiers. It's got two 12AU7s and two 12AX7s. And so it'll be interesting to see how this one performs and the gain that this one has. This one does have a myriad of um, RCA inputs with a And this is the selector switch. So you can pick between like four different inputs. So that's kind of a nice feature. And I haven't wired up the sub out on this. I'm still toying with the idea of possibly putting a switch here in the middle, um, just an up and down switch to switch between CD and phono, because those are the two inputs I use most of the time. And it would be nice not to swap cables. But I also know that means more possibility of having the input signal exposed to noise running it through a switch and that kind of thing so i have to think about that plus i may want to go ahead and do the sub out i did do a little research and to do the high pass filter for the going to the tube amp i will have to configure it for the load the amp's going to have on it and I'm not sure how that's going to play out with having a volume control on the input. Might want to wait until I get an actual power amp 
that I know I'm going to be powering this with and configure it for that specific amplifier. The, um, the low pass filter is fairly easy and it doesn't, what's after it doesn't really matter. And so it would be fairly easy to, uh, to configure a low pass filter for the sub out. So who knows, we may just go ahead and do that too. So anyway, hope you've enjoyed this preamp series. I'm probably going to go ahead and start another playlist on the shootout and keep this build series as a separate thing because that was just for this one preamp. And the shootout is probably only going to be one or two videos at most. Probably going to do one video on the scope and the distortion numbers with the audio analyzer suite and then kind of a final verdict thing of tube rolling and listening to them for a couple of weeks and see which one sounds the best to me. So I do hope you're enjoying this preamp series and you'll go out there and try to build one of these preamps for yourself. It wasn't that hard. And I think, you know, there's probably a ton of cool cases out there that you could put this board into. I think this is going to be a good sounding preamp. But again, until I look it up to a system, I don't know. But we'll see when we do our shootout. So if you're enjoying the series and the channel, please subscribe. Please like the video. And we'll see you on the next round of preamp shootout. Have a great day.